Right, so uh, um, yes, I'll be talking about Windows drivers attack surface, some new insights. Um, so my name is Ilya. Um, I work for a company called IOActive. I am their director of penetration testing. Um, I do pen test, code review, basically break stuff for fun and profit. Um, and I'm here to talk today about uh, uh, Windows uh, drivers attack surface. Um, it's sort of divided up into, you know, I have a little intro, and then I've got two pieces. And piece one talks about, gives you some, some background and talks about the where. And then part two is sort of the, the guts of the talk, and it talks about the what. Um, I got a lot of ground to cover today, so I'm going to uh, try and move my way through part one really fast. Um, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, if I don't, I, I'll run over, so I kind of have to. Um, so yeah, what's this talk about? Basically, I'm going to be talking about um, the attack surface of uh, uh, Windows uh, WDM, which is the Windows driver model uh, drivers, um, and, and specifically about the implementation security. Um, I, I guess the audience is sort of the, you know, if, if you're looking for bugs in Windows drivers, this talk might be interesting. Um, if you're a driver developer, this talk might be interesting. Uh, if you're just curious about this kind of security stuff, then this talk might be interesting too. Um, in terms of uh, uh, knowledge, it, it'd be nice if you have some kind of general background on, you know, what, what uh, an operation kernel looks like, and if you have sp some specific knowledge about Windows uh, uh, kernel and Windows drivers, that's even better, but not necessarily required. Um, before I, I talk uh, uh, about uh, my presentation, it, 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 it's clear to say that, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, there, there are, have been a number of, of people that have done research in these things. Um, and I would do a disservice if I didn't at least put their names up there. Um, if you think I missed someone, please let me know. I'd, I'd like to add their name to it. Um, but I think this is a, a fairly good list. Um, this, this talk is slightly different than most of those, though. Um, so if you look at the, most of the previous research on, on Windows kernel and Windows drivers, it's mostly been uh, focused on exploitation. Um, and it's usually been focused on the Windows kernel specifically and not so much on, on drivers. Uh, and it's almost always been focused on like one particular issue. Uh, and so my presentation is different in the sense that um, the focus is, isn't so much on uh, exploitation, but it is more on the finding, identifying of bugs, and then giving some kind of guidance on how, to, how would you mitigate or fix these issues. Um, also, it isn't so much about the Windows kernel itself as it is about specific drivers. Of course, they go in hand in hand. You, you can't really have one without the other. So mo much, most of this stuff applies to the Windows kernel as well and vice versa. Uh, but it, it, it's a slight difference, though. And the other thing is that I'm not talking about one particular issue. Uh, what I did is I sort of sat down and, and said, um, looked at all of the common bugs you have or you find in most Windows um, drivers and sort of try to find the common theme around it and a thread. And that's basically what I'll be talking about today. Um, right, so the intro is basically, basically this, this talk's intro. Um, you could easily spend days talking about all sorts of intricate little details about um, Windows driver bugs. And so I tried to um, uh, get it down in, in the one hour thing. Um, and basically it comes down to all of these little uh, obscure things that very few people seem to know about them and what the consequences are um, if, you, if, you, if, if you know or don't know about these little things or if you do them wrong or, um, and, and whether or not that's documented or not. And it turns out some of those things are kind of, like most of it will, you'll find it on MSDN, but a lot of it is like you have to read between the lines. Uh, you'll have these subtle hints as to, uh, um, you know, uh, what is problematic and what isn't. Uh, but quite often, it's not explicitly mentioned. Um, and so it makes it very hard for people to, to know these things. And that includes, unfortunately, most uh, uh, driver developers. Um, so with that, let's dive into uh, part one. Uh, so yeah, this, this section is meant by no means to be exhaustive. It's a quick reminder, uh, and I'm going to try to make my way through it uh, really fast. Um, so basically, um, yeah, i will start off with a little bit of architecture. Basically, um, at a high level, the Windows kernel is divided up into all of these managers that have these little, their own tasks to do. And the idea is that you as a user, if you want to get to them, you basically call system calls, and then you end up in one of these managers. Uh, for example, if you do anti-device IO control, you end up in the IO manager. Um, from uh, 50,000 feet view, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so you have, I don't know if you, no, you don't, okay. Um, basically, um, 
from Userland, you uh, call on system calls, and then you go into you know, your call table, and then it'll go into one of these managers. Quite often, you end up in the IO manager. Um, uh, in, inside, um, inside this thing, there's a whole bunch of frameworks working together. Um, there's there's uh, over a dozen, um, and all of these are worthy of their own presentation, and I wish I could talk about all of them, uh, but get, due to time constraints, um, I'm going to limit myself to uh, w, the Windows driver model, WDM, uh, and a tiny, tiny little bit about uh, KMDF. Um, so yeah, what is WDM? It's basically the Windows driver model. It's been around since around Windows 2000. Uh, it sort of uh, extends and updates the old NT driver model. Uh, it is the standard uh, model for how drivers are written. Um, I mean, in recent years, there's been a shift towards KMDF, but there's still a fair amount of WDM. Um, and so um, that's why we, I'll, I'll basically focus on WDM. Um, so let me now say a few things about uh, the IO manager, which is sort of, it's, it, it, it's this proxy that sits in between the user and going to drivers. Um, and uh, depending on what kind of requests you do, it may or may not do some kind of validation. Uh, uh, once it, and, and so it takes your request from user land, uh, and then it uh, sort of packages it up in this thing called a, an in, uh, IO request packet, an ERP, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then basically it finds your driver's dispatch routine for whatever thing you want to do and sort of hands it off to there. Um, and let me try and illustrate that with some code. So basically if you have like a simple, a very, very simple driver, basically has this thing called a driver entry, which is basically the, the main entry point. And then essentially any driver that wants to have interaction with user land, um, goes to the I.O. manager and says, hey, create this device. They call I.O. create device. And then they say, okay, now that the device is created, uh, I want user land to be able to talk to it. And so they go to the I.O. manager and say, um, I.O. create symbolic link. And basically what it does, it creates a symbolic link for user land to talk to that device. Um, and so um, basically this means is you register a bunch of dispatch calls to the I.O. manager, and then you um, uh, Basically, um, you can do ioctals or FS controls or open, read, and write, and so forth. Uh, in code, this kind of looks like this, where basically, you know, as I mentioned before, you do a create device, create symbolic link, and then you do all of these dispatch functions. And then for all of those functions, you basically have, um, and, and there's more of these. Um, uh, but basically, for all of these functions, it kind of looks like this, where there's uh, two, uh, um, arguments that get passed along as a device object and the actual ERP. Um, and so the ERP is, is, is interesting because it, uh, this contains all of the data um, that's packaged up from userland that your um, uh, driver gets access to. Um, and this in, uh, includes things like, you know, uh, data being passed around, uh, your I.O. status, uh, what kind of request, what you are. Uh, and basically it's sort of just this kind of nicely completes it where it says, okay, this is the, the pointers that come from land. This is the system pointer, user pointer, uh, memory descriptor lists, um, your ERP stack. Um, and so let's talk about the ERP stack. Um, basically, the, the, for every ERP that comes in, it associated, there's a stack associated with, this, with it, which is this ERP stack. Um, and it contains uh, very specific information that your driver needs for that particular operation. Um, and so it, it, it'll say, okay, um, I, you were called with this major minor function number. Um, it's this device object, it's this file object. And then uh, based upon uh, which major minor function number, there's a specific parameter union. Uh, and it'll have different sets of, of uh, elements inside union uh, based upon whether it's an or a read or a write and so, and so forth. Um, but essentially all the specific data you need, you tend to grab out of your ERP stack. Um, and then, of course, from userland, how do you get to there? Well, you call this, you know, um, NT device control file uh, um, system call. Um, and then if you look at sort of the, the last five arguments are the ones where there, there's, you know, potential for, for attack surface and, and where the, uh, uh, the entry in, 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 into uh, driver happens, which is uh, um, your control code, um, your input buffer, input buffer length, output buffer, output buffer length. Um, and so, okay. Um, one, once that sort of goes through the I.O. manager and it goes to your driver, the driver goes to, um, base, goes to your um, device control dispatch and sort of packages up the SERP and hands it over. Um, so how, depending on uh, um, your I.O. control code, 
uh, the way the Zeta gets packaged up uh, um, differs. Um, and so let's look at what the I.O. control code looks like. Um, even though it may look like just a number, it's actually um, split up into several different bits and pieces. Um, from a security perspective, um, we really only care about two pieces of those, the required access and the transfer type. Um, and so I'll say a little bit about, about uh, transfer type and the required access. Uh, required access is basically one of three. It says file any, file read data, and file write data. And what that means is if you open a handle to a device uh, and you say, you know, I open it as read only, and then you issue an IOC that uh, requires file uh, write data, for example, uh, the IO manager sees, oh, your handle only read is only open for read, but your actual code says file write data. That, that doesn't match, and so the IO manager will kick you out. Um, and so this, this restricts you to um, the, the required access that you need. Um, and so the other one is the transfer type, and there's basically four different kinds of transfer type. There's the uh, buffered, neither, indirect, and outdirect. And so let me, let me uh, sort of run through those real quickly. Uh, the first one is uh, method buffered. Uh, and method buffered is sort of the uh, preferred, safe-ish way of uh, it passing octals from, from, uh, uh, to, to drivers. Uh, what that means is the I.O. manager basically looks um, at the data that userland passes in, and it says, okay, your input buffer is, I don't know, let's say 10 bytes big. What I'll do is I'll mirror it. I'll create a kernel buffer that's 10 bytes big, and I'll copy your data over. Um, and then I'll pass that on uh, to the driver. And what that means is the driver doesn't have to worry about, you know, uh, race conditions or making sure that the address is, is within user and, and doesn't point a kernel and all these tricks, you don't have to worry about it if you're using method buffered. Um, additionally, uh, when the kernel does all that uh, copying of data around, it charges uh, um, quota for your memory. So if you hit your quota, then that fails and it sort of returns and, and, and fails. Um, so method buffered is sort of the, the safe-ish way of passing data around. Um, Meta neither is the exact opposite. Um, it, the IO manager does nothing. The IO manager basically um, takes the data um, given to it as is and sort of passes it on um, to your driver. So your input buffer, your input buffer length, your output buffer, output buffer length, they're just raw pointers and raw lengths that have not been validated and uh, pass along to your driver. Um, this is the endless sewers of Windows driver bugs. Um, it, it, it's, uh, in my view, as, as a driver writer, you should avoid them at all costs. Uh, fortunately, it that's, doesn't appear. Um, I mean, there's plenty of people, plenty of drivers that do this stuff. Um, and I mean, there's a perf benefit, um, but it, it's, uh, it's a huge strain on, 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 on uh, resources for security because you have to manually check everything yourself. Um, so in order to just do uh, sort of um, describe meta indirect and meta outdirect, I first have to um, say something about these things called MDLs. Uh, and an MDL is basically, it's called a memory descriptor list, um, and it's a, um, a data structure in the Windows kernel that represents a, a buffer by its physical address. Um, and I'm not gonna discuss, because the, the internals are kind of opaque, but basically, um, Windows kernel has APIs to uh, create, modify, delete, and consume these MDLs. Um, so that you can go and say, okay, well, I have this, uh, this MDL that describes physical buffer now, um, give me a kernel virtual address for it, for example. And um, uh, the, uh, um, I think it's the, the memory manager that'll do it then for you and basically hands you back a pointer. Um, the, why is this important? It's important because in, in, in this particular case where the IO manager passes stuff back and forth, what usually happens is you have this double mapping. So what happens is the user goes to kernel to IO manager and says, um, oh, I have this, this user land pointer and, and, this, and this length. And the IO manager goes to it and says, okay, I'm gonna create an MDL that um, sees what this user land pointer is and figures out what the um, physical memory bind is. And then, uh, you know, if it's more than page, it f f finds all the physical memory pages and sort of pa packages it up in MDL and passes that off to your driver. And then when a driver looks at it, um, it'll see the MDL and say, okay, um, now uh, get me the kernel virtual address for it. And so you get the sort of double mapping in user and kernel that both map to the same physical page. Um, and the reason why you would do that is um, so you get um, these situations where if you have to copy large amounts of data around, uh, because you're using MDLs, you now have zero copy. And so you get a, a huge, huge perf increase. Um, essentially, that's, if you draw an MS Paint, that's what it looks like. Um, 
Yeah, and so uh, this is done for, for perf and you get zero copy. Additionally, you know, you have no pain of probing and try accept. Um, and so uh, uh, there are definitely um, upsides to MDLs. There's also downsides to it, and I'll get to that later. Uh, but essentially, now that I've, you have an idea what MDLs are, um, basically about indirect and about direct are these things where that indirect is sort of the, okay, um, the input is going to be an MDL, and so um, when your driver takes input and starts reading from it, it'll come from an MDL. And when you use an out direct, it's going to be the exact opposite, where it's like once your driver generates output, you just put it to an MDL, and then um, user automatically basically gets it. In short, that's what these things are. Um, okay, so um, this is sort of my last slide for part one. So I, I hope I wasn't too confusing. I know I ran through it really fast, but it's because the next section is really where all the, the cool stuff is. Um, but um, so most of the stuff I, 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 I talked about or will talk about is, is this WDM model, which is older. And so KMDF is this new kernel mode driver framework. Um, and it, it's part of what's called a, a WDF, which is the, the something uh, uh, driver framework. Um, and basically, um, this thing was made sort of, um, it was designed based upon uh, learned mistakes from uh, the WDM world. Um, a lot of that has to do with power management and things like that. Um, but also for security, um, a, a few things uh, became apparent and it sort of uh, uh, made easier to, to, to do and use in KMDF. Um, and so in general, KMDF makes it easier to write, dri uh, write drivers and less likely to introduce uh, bugs. Um, but it is layered over the same infrastructure that WDM still uses. That is to say, if you don't understand uh, the old model, uh, you're still going to have sort of these implicit KMDF bugs. Um, but in general, it does make it harder uh, to have bugs. Um, and so one example, security-wise, is a great one, is where um, uh, it strongly discourages the use of passing user land pointers directly to kernel. Uh, and in fact, so they have these set of APIs to sort of extract data out of the requests. Um, so one of them is a WDF, WDF uh, re request retrieve input buffer. Um, and if you have a uh, method buffered or method indirect or method outdirect, um, that API will just go grab the pointers for you. Uh, but if you're using method neither, that API will totally fail. And if you must use method neither, um, then you have to call this new API called WDF request retrieve unsave user input buffer. Um, and that, I mean, pretty explicitly tells you that it's unsafe. Um, and, uh, uh, and so uh, it's one of these things where, you know, they really knew that using these uh, method uh, neither things are horrible, and so they made it really hard for you to use it. Uh, and so if you do use it, you know, the names very explicitly tell you that things are unsafe. Um, so, and generally as a driver developer, you're encouraged to use KMDF over WDM. Um, and the cool thing about KMDF is that it's actually open sourced. Um, earlier this year, Microsoft slapped an MIT license on it and put it on GitHub. Um, and uh, about 90% of that code is there. Uh, there's tiny bits and pieces still missing. The, the redirector isn't there yet. Uh, but it, by and large, the guts of KMDF are totally available under a, 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 a free software license, I guess. Um, and if you want, you can totally take a look at them. Okay. So now that we got that out of the way, um, let's uh, dive into um, the what of uh, um, Windows driver's attack surface. Um, so basically, um, by and large, when you look at a, 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 the sort of bugs you have um, in a driver, there's sort of three things that come up, right? Um, they can be elevation of privilege bugs, you know, like a buffer overflow or something like it. Uh, they can be denial of service, right, where you get um, a kernel panic or a deadlock or you know, uh, resource starvation type of attacks. Uh, and the third one is where you get information leaks, right? By and large, those are the ones you would see when you look for uh, security implementation bugs in, 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 uh, in drivers. Uh, and so that's sort of the, by and large, the kind of things that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. Um, specifically, things that I'm not covering are um, exploitation or bypassing of mitigations. Um, for the most part, there's bits and pieces where I'll sort of mention some of that. But by and large, uh, I'm working from the assumption that bugs are going to be exploitable. Um, if that's not what you're looking for, I mean, this isn't an exploitation talk, which is what I pretty much start off with saying. Um, so I won't be focusing on exploitation. I will instead be focusing on f sort of finding, identifying these type of bugs and uh, uh, sort of uh, developer guidance on how to fix those kind of issues. 
Um, the other thing is that I'm assuming that you guys have a basic understanding of, you know, native code security. So I, I won't discuss, you know, the standard buffer overflow or integer overflow or, you know, what it mean, if you have an unvalid length field. I'm assuming those things are understood. Uh, same thing for, you know, C++ type of bugs or, or those kind of things. Um, so just because I said I didn't, wasn't going to cover intro flows, um, I lied. I am actually going to say something about them, um, specifically because um, in the Windows kernel, you actually have these APIs to help you um, not have intro flows. They'll, they'll have a set of APIs you can use. Um, and if you are a driver developer, you are encouraged to use them, even though I haven't seen them all that often. And you should, in fact, use them. But uh, when you use these APIs, um, you should sort of, um, uh, there is still potential for misuse. And basically, um, when you use the APIs, there's sort of the three things you should always or never do is always check your return value, always pass in the exact type, and always do, uh, never do arithmetic when passing parameters. Because when you do any of those three things, you're basically sort of reintroducing your integer issues when you're trying to use these new APIs. Um, and I have examples of this stuff, um, but for in the interest of time, I'm sort of just going <laughs> to really fast. Basically, the stuff on the left is wrong, and the stuff on the right is correct. Um, so the stuff on the left is sort of the, here's how to use the APIs wrong, and here's how to use the correct use of the APIs. Um, okay, so basically now I come down to sort of, what I did is I sort of uh, um, sat down and s sort of, you know, looked over, you know, what most common security bugs are in drivers and sort of tried to figure out um, if, like, what's the common theme around all these? And I came up with this idea where there's five things that almost, that most drivers will do um, if they're talking to user land um, where there's potential for attack surface and, 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 and where you have some kind of entry point. And basically it comes down to um, when you create a device, uh, when you talk to IO manager, when you handle data, um, when you interact with the memory manager, and when you interact with the, with the object manager. By and large, those five areas, um, a driver will, if, if they talk to user, those are the five big areas where you have uh, attack surface. I mean, there's, it's not, you know, I mean, there can be other ways too, but by and large, it's, it, my view, it's, it's, it's those five. Um, and so basically, I sort of um, structured my next set of slides around these five areas, and then for each one of these five, um, basically, I'll discuss a few things that I've seen gone wrong and do, and so I'll have the first set of slides and I'll have a, a cute little icon on the left top that indicates this is a bug and then a cute little icon with some tools that says this is a fix. Um, but by and large, I go by these five and then for each one of these five, there's a couple of cases that I cover. Um, so with that, let's start with device creation, right? Um, as I showed earlier in, in, in the... Um, in the uh, sample uh, driver is, uh, when you create a device, you basically... Um, have this API call, which is IO create device or IO create device secure, and your driver basically goes to the IO manager and says, please create a device for me. Um, and uh, when you do that, um, you can pass, ac you can say, okay, these are the access controls that I want on it. And uh, there's two ways of doing that, right? One is you call IO create device secure, and you can uh, pass around this, what's called SCDL string, which is uh, uh, a, uh, a string representation of a security descriptor, which basically says who can and can't access the device under what conditions. Um, if you don't call IO create device, the other way to do it is um, the, you specify the SCDL string in the INF file that comes with your driver, um, and then uh, that will be applied um, uh, uh, by your manager um, when, when somebody tries to connect to your device. Uh, commonly, though, these things are missing. Uh, you'll see a lot of drivers that they'll call uh, um, just uh, IO create device and they won't specify uh, an SDL string in INF. Uh, so you fall back to either, uh, you know, uh, d default or sort of uh, uh, an ACL that's too wide. Um, uh, this is just a common sort of simple d d design problem w w that you see with drivers that are thrown together uh, too fast. Um, uh, basically, the idea is that you just sit down and sort of try to figure out who needs access to your device and, and under what circumstances. Um, and I mean, it, it, it has value to sit down and really think about this, uh, because what you're doing is you're, you can try to reduce kernel attack surface, right? 
Um, and so one good, you know, proper engineering example would be to sort of uh, uh, sit down and say, okay, well, we have these set of ioctals that really an admin should only ever need to do. So what we're going to do is we're, we'll, create a, we'll create a driver that is only accessible by an admin, and then what we'll do is we'll create a surface on top of that that you can then talk to through, I don't know, UDP or RPC or whatever, um, and then they have the service sort of reroute things to the kernel only when it needs to. Um, so in, in that example, you know, the... Uh, um, uh, the downside of that is that you know you have to write more code and you may get some performance degradation, uh, but the upside is um, you get you know extra security and probably you know better reliability as well. Um, so that that that's one solution. But but the idea is basically that um, uh, this is this is usually a design this question where it's like okay, who really needs access to our device and 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 and, and why, right? Okay, so um, with that said, let's move on to some more implementation stuff for device creation. Um, when you create this uh, device, you call this IO Create Device API, and basically you're allowed to pass these device characteristics into it. Um, and it basically there's one bit in there, which is this thing called uh, File Device Secure Open. Um, and it has very special meaning. So basically, uh, when you create a device in, in, in the Windows kernel, uh, by default, the I.O. manager will always assume that it is a file system device. Uh, and what that means is that, you know, when you open the device, um, the I.O. manager basically assumes that it has, you know, directories and files. Um, and so if you do, instead of you open device, you say device slash file, um, the I.O. manager looks at it and says, oh, I don't have to apply the ACLs here. The file system has to do it. I'll just go to the file system device and, and let the file system device handle it. And that works really well if you're a file system uh, driver. But if you're not a file system driver, which most drivers are, uh, um, so if you're not a file system driver, um, all of a sudden you have this problem where the I.O. manager thinks you are and it, doesn't, it won't apply your ACLs and then hands it off to you, but you're not checking a meter, and so all of a sudden, um, if you don't set this particular flag and you're not a file system uh, driver, uh, you have this sort of by design automatic echo, bi echo bypass problem. Um, and so that's why um, pretty much every time you create a, um, a driver and you're not a file system driver, you should really, really set this flag. Um, and it's, it's bizarre because it's actually documented and there's a lot of, a lot of drivers that are not doing this. Um, and what's really funny is that um, this bug is incredibly, incredibly easy to find. Um, there's a tool out there called Device Tree, and it enumerates all of your devices, and you click on it, and you basically, it'll allow you, it's kind of hard to see there, but you can basically see who, see what the ACLs are, and then it also sa says whether this um, file device secure flag is set. And so if the flag isn't set, um, and the ACLs basically say, oh, this is only admin, um, then, you know, you most likely have a security bug right there, and it's, it's, like it's one click away, it's easy to find. Um, so what's the fix for this one? Uh, basically, always use the flag. Um, unless you are very sp specifically building uh, um, a file system driver, you should always, always set this flag. Um, that's the general rule. Um, now, some people go, well, you know, you don't have to set this flag. You can sort of make your own, um, create a dispatch callback and sort of do it in there, and, and yes, you absolutely can. Um, you probably shouldn't because A, you're now adding more attack surface even though this functionality is already there in the Windows kernel. Just you know, set that one bit and you get it for free. Um, two is um, what if you do do it yourself, th there, there's a few intricate sort of little things that um, you, you want to try and mimic exactly what the IO manager does in that case. Um, otherwise, you, know, you get these sort of, you know, um, sort of discrepancies. Um, so yes, you can't do that, um, but unless you're doing a file system driver, probably shouldn't. Okay, so that's one of five. So the second, second of, of the five I had is basically, um, so uh, working with the I.O. manager. Um, and the first case I had is sort of a, a simple one, but this is, this is a pretty common one I've seen uh, in, in a bunch of drivers where basically you'll have some like IOCTAL callback and it'll be meta indirect or meta out direct. Um, and it'll say, okay, well, we'll use the ERP MDL address and we'll uh, sort of get our, uh, 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 do the MM get system address for MDL safe and we get our kernel pointer out of it, um, all without ever checking if that pointer can be null. Um, it can be null by, you know, by sheer, the fact that the way it works is that that pointer can absolutely be null. And so before you ever touch our ERP MDL address, you should check it for being a null pointer. 
Um, and this one of the cases where it can happen is if it's a zero-sized um, uh, buffer. Um, if, if you're not doing that, um, then you may very well have um, a, a bug check or, or worse, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but the idea is that uh, um, if, if you're doing met, in met address, check your MDL address before you use it, um, which is also fixed, great. Um, so the second sort of uh, problem-ish um, in the IO manager class is um, uh, using MetaBuffered. I, I, I discussed MetaBuffered before, and I said it is the sort of safer option, um, and, and, and it is, um, but uh, there's still some things you know. Is A is similar with the MDL address is that um, the, the pointer you are given from the driver spectrum in, in the ERP uh, for, by, for MetaBuffered um, is this ERP associate uh, or a system buffer, um, and it's, the problem is similar to the MDL, MDL address where that point can also be null. So the first thing you should do is always always check, make sure it's not null. Um, the other thing with meta buffered is um, that even though it is the, the safer, or, or I guess the safest uh, uh, method of all four, um, is that uh, because it's seen that way, you get this sort of false sense of security. Um, in that while, you know, probing and capturing of the whole buffer happens for you, um, any and all of the content inside of that buffer still needs, depending on what it is, still needs any kind of validation, right? Um, and so there's a set of developers that'll say, oh, meta buffered, cool, we're good, we don't need to do any security checking. Um, and then, you know, they'll have some kind of embedded length fields that are never validated and used to copy stuff around and, you know, all of a sudden you get memory corruptions left and right. Um, so, yeah, the idea with, uh, um, uh, 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 meta buffer is that A, validate for null, and B, um, all the embedded content still has to be validated. Um, one of my, uh, my all-time sort of pet peeves or, or uh, kernel bugs is this, um, basically, um, once, let's say you get an ioctl, and you do all the work and everything, and you're successful, and the ioctl is completed correctly, and you're about to sort of return, and you, you basically, there's a field in, the, in your ERP that says IO status. And you basically say, okay, IO status, success. And then there's this thing called IO status information. And the information is, it's basically an integer. And in, in the case of success, what that means is, uh, I have completed successfully, and these are the amount of bytes that I give to you as output. Um, and um, basically, the, quite often what people will do is, um, They'll go to um, IO status dot information. They'll say, okay, um, whatever um, output buffer length that the user gave me, um, that's that that's the number I give you. Um, and sure enough, you work, you, you do that, and everything works. Nothing crashes. You get all the data you need, and everything works perfectly. Um, but there's this very subtle thing where um, basically all of a sudden you have this information leak. Um, so basically, what happens is. When you do an ioctl and you go to the IO manager and you have meta buffered, the IO manager looks at um, your input length and your output length, and it says, okay, which one of these two is the maximum? And it says, okay, let's say the output length is the, is, is the bigger one. It goes and says, okay, um, malloc of kernel buffer of um, that amount of data. And then it sees um, what is the length of the input buffer? And it says, oh, the input buffer is X, great. We'll take the input buffer and we'll use that length and we'll copy it into this buffer I just to locate it. So if you have an input buffer that is smaller than the output buffer, then the delta between input and output is uninitialized memory. Um, and if you now have this bug where at the end of the, all, you're done all, all the way at the end, um, and what you've copied into the output buffer is smaller than the uh, uh, total or located space that is available, um, then that, that delta all the way at the end is uninitialized memory. And so if you then go and say, um, you know, IO status um, uh, dot information is, you know, the full buffer length, then that includes that piece of uninitialized data all the way at the end. Uh, and that gets copied back to userland, and then when userland gets the buffer, um, they can just read that stuff. Um, it, it, it's kind of subtle because it's, stuff doesn't crash, stuff doesn't break, you have to really look for it. Um, but quite often, when, when you have these kind of bugs, is you can you can rig this so you get really large buffers. You can say, I want a one or two gig buffer, and all of a sudden you get just piles and piles and piles of uninitialized data that comes out of kernel and contains all sorts of interesting things. Um, and so this is in, I reverse out of a driver, uh, but it, it's it's a fairly common bug to see uh, because you can test all you want, this thing will never crash. It's it's kind of subtle. 
So unless you know about this bug explicitly, uh, you, you, people don't find it either in testing or, or, or for looking for security bugs. Uh, but it's basically the, this, the common case is where you, you start your, your, your uh, dispatch routine and you say, okay, this is the output buffer length the user gave me, and then you do all the work, and then all the way at the end when you're done, you say, okay, I was status information, is we start off with the output buffer length, and boof, off we go, and all of a sudden this thing just leaked uh, information. Um, what's, the other thing that's really interesting about this one is um, uh, even though this is a, a WDM thing, and even though KMDF is sort of built on top of this, um, in, in KMDF, uh, you'll still, you can still have this particular mistake. Um, you don't actually um, manually fill out the members of the ERP, uh, but um, KMDF gives you a set of APIs to do it to, where you basically just pass parameters. So it's a WDF request complete with information, WDF request set information. Uh, both of them fill out this IO status field. Um, uh, and you know, if it's uh, too large, you have the, the same problem. And because um, uh, KMDF is open source, you can just go look at source and see what these functions do. And indeed, if you look it up and you see what these functions do, you'll see that um, internally they still look up the ERP and they go and say, IO status, dot information, then the link you give it. Um, the fix here is, is simple. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit um, uh, um, hard to figure out initially because um, the, the bug itself is so subtle that, you know, because nothing crashes, nothing ever misbehaves, um, it, it, it's kind of subtle that way. Uh, but once you're aware of it, the, the bug's really easy and it's incredibly easy to fix. Basically, you know, anytime you set the information, um, you should just be exact. Uh, if you copy five bytes in there, then say that, right? Always record the amount of bytes you put in there and then just make that your status on information and you never have that bug again. Um, uh, the, the thing is, though, um, it, you have to be consistent about it, and that, and that, that can be pretty hard, uh, especially if you're reviewing um, old code. Um, and so it's really easy to miss one or two cases um, that, is, you know, that is still lying around code that was written 20 years ago. Um, okay, so um, the last part about the O manager uh, that I want to talk about, um, and this is sort of in, in broad strokes, uh, is, is about ERP cancellation. And uh, the reason why it's, it's, I, is, is I talk about it broadly and not specifically is because it, it's incredibly complex stuff and I could easily fill you know, a one hour lecture just about ERP cancellation stuff. Um, so basically what happens is um, when you know, UserLand does an IOCTL and it, go, it comes to the driver and the driver says, okay, well this is a, an IOCTL that I can't complete right away and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go take this ERP and pend it and I'm gonna go back to UserLand and say, hey, uh, come back later, or I'll give you a signal later once I'm done, you can go do something else now. And then uh, once the driver is done, it says, okay, well, this ERP is now completed, and then it you know, signals user land and says, hey, I'm done. Um, the time in between is, is, is undefined, depending on what the driver does, is supposed to do, can possibly be a long time. For example, something that's disk-based, um, and so basically at any point after the, um, the ERP is pended and UserLand knows that the kernel sort of pended it and is working on it, uh, UserLand can go back to the kernel and say, oh hey, uh, you know that driver that's holding my ERP, um, I've, I'm, I'm done waiting, you, you've taken way too long, uh, just cancel the damn ERP. Um, and then basically the driver sort of gets woken up again and finds your ERP and cancels it. Um, and the problem with this is that there's this potential for all these like race conditions, right? Where you'll have one thread that's still trying to work on the Europe and you'll have another thread that has been instructed to cancel it. And so you have one guy working on it, one guy canceling it. Um, and if they're, if they're not in perfect sync, you have all sort of these weird, weird race conditions. Um, and, and so that stuff gets incredibly complicated. Um, and, and so there, there are literally dozens and dozens of examples of what this stuff looks like, and I wish I could get into it, uh, but I can't. Uh, but I will say, though, that uh, ERP cancellation uh, routines that have synchronization issues often lead to deadlocks, memory leaks, race conditions, double freeze, and use after freeze. So all the stuff that, you know, if you're a security guy looking for bugs that you start drooling when you hear those things, um, they're all in there. Um, and I really wish I could get into detail. Um, and so, uh, um, uh, Fix-wise, uh, it's kind of, there is no easy advice to give. The stuff is just extremely complex. Um, and and it's sort of the, when you do ERP cancellation, um, be very careful, be extremely conservative. 
um, Im implement with care, um, you know, double check, triple check, have it peer review, check again. Um, you know, it, it, try to use uh, uh, cancel um, uh, safe herb cues. Um, um, that's pretty much it, unfortunately. There, there's no better advice. Um, okay, so uh, now that we've got those two down, um, let's move on to um, user land and, and data pointers. Um, and so I guess we should first talk about the elephant in the room, um, which is basically, you know, what if a driver takes, you know, uh, Po uh, um, direct pointers from user land. Um, what you're supposed to do these things called, uh, you know, probing, which is basically, you know, a fancy word for uh, is this pointer within the range that user land is 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 allowed to be, um, and and including the the length and and then the end pointer and does it not overflow and all those things. And that's basically what the probe for read and probe for write functions do. <coughs> uh, okay. There we go. Um, so basically, you know, uh, um, it, it, if your driver uh, takes points from user land, you're supposed to do this kind of probing. If you don't probe, so let's say you take a pointer from uh, user land and you forget to probe um, and you read from it, uh, basically that's uh, potentially information leak. Uh, you could be reading uh, from anywhere and you could definitely crash. And depending if that information gets sent back to user land, uh, you could potentially in in info leak. Um, um, so that's bad, uh, but if you get a pointer from user land and you don't probe and you write from it, you basically get this sort of a write anything anywhere primitive in kernel, and that is extremely bad. Um, you, you basically just own the kernel um, if you're doing that. Um, and so basically, to try to prevent these cases, um, you do uh, uh, probing and use the probe for read and probe for write APIs. Um, and so this is, this is one example. I think this is some Intel driver. Um, where basically, um, you know, the, you take an input buffer and then basically um, you, uh, there's no probing anywhere in between and you just sort of read and write from it. Um, but suffice to say, these bugs, unfortunately, are extremely, extremely common. Um, another interesting sort of uh, uh, nugget with this stuff is that, um, and this, I think this was noted a few years ago, is that, um, so these probe APIs, basically the way they work is you say, okay, here's my user land pointer, um, here's the length I want you to probe for, and here's the alignment. Um, and you can have these very subtle bugs where people do probe, but for whatever reason, uh, the length given to the probing is zero. Um, and Windows APIs basically go, the, the, those probe APIs basically say, okay, well, if the length is zero, short circuit logic uh, return success. Um, and that is perfectly valid. You know, if, if I say a probe, of, a probe of zero, then I mean, you know, clearly that's zero. Um, it, the thing is that there's a little bit of risk here when, you, when, when that's being done. Basically, the idea is that if, if you probe with a length of zero, uh, and then later on you basically use that address, but then you read or write one byte, um, obviously the bug there is that you have a length discrepancy between zero and one, um, but the difference is that um, because the way the pro APIs work, this link discrepancy becomes incredibly exploitable, right? If the pro APIs had worked away where they said, okay, well, the length is zero, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna make the link one and we'll just probe that particular address, um, it would make these bugs far less exploitable. Um, and, and, and so that's why, there, that's why there's risk here. Uh, the common case for where these kind of uh, bugs can happen where you do have a probe with length zero is A, um, you'll, you'll see this code where um, they'll take they'll take a, um, they'll take like an, an input buffer length, an input buffer, um, and they'll just assume it's of a certain length, and they never actually double check what the length really is. But they still pass the original input buffer length to the pro functions. Um, and so, if you forget that kind of length check, uh, you end up with these exact uh, kind of issues. Um, the other one is where if you do length checks, is that you may still have like length integer overflows, where the probing length just happens to overflow right back to zero. Um, so, so that, that can happen too. <clears throat> so the fix basically is uh, perform correct, consistent probing, always, always, always probe. Um, it's easier than it looks. Um, it, you always forget one somewhere. Um, it's one of these things where once you start, like if, you, if it's all in one simple function, then that tends to be easy, but you'll have these things where you have these complex drivers where it calls a function that calls a function that calls a function, and somewhere down the road, you're not quite sure if it's a user pointer or a kernel pointer. Um, and then, you know, you, you end up uh, uh, missing a probe. Um, 
so the second sort of uh, uh, variation of this is, okay, let's say you take a kernel pointer, uh, you take user pointer and kernel in your driver, and you've now probed it, and then you're gonna start using it. Um, you can still do things that are horribly wrong. So every time you use a, a, a pointer, a user land pointer in kernel, um, even after it's probed, is that you must always wrap this in a, in a try accept. Um, the, the reason being is that if you don't do it in a try accept, is that um, after, you've, after it's been probed, you can have a second user land thread that takes you know, your mapped address and basically changes the page protections or unmaps them. And then the, somewhere in the kernel, after the probing, they go, oh, I'll, we'll just use these pointers. And all of a sudden, um, they're reading or writing to uh, unmapped pages, uh, which will throw, a, it'll throw an exception. Um, and so that's why you must always do a, a try accept. Um, and so the obvious case is to uh, forget exception handling. Um, but in the less obvious case uh, is maybe you do have a, a try accept case. Um, but the thing is, uh, the you know accept case is rarely exercised because you know it's the exception, right? It almost never happens, um, and, and as such, uh, these bugs in, in uh, exception handlers um, often don't show up in testing simply because it's never been exercised. Um, and so, um, even if you do uh, try accept with user land pointers, it's still quite often to notice things like memory leaks and, refer and uh, reference count leaks. Um, <clears throat> So the fix here basically is um, A, use try accept when uh, using user land pointer, and B, uh, is uh, um, make sure your exception logic is sane. Uh, exception logic can be really tricky, uh, and so you wanna design and implement that stuff with care. Um, sort of, uh, okay, another bug related to uh, user land pointers is what, I, they're called double fetches. So the idea basically is, um, I, I'm user land, I go call into a driver and I say, okay, here's user land pointer. And the driver takes the pointer and it does the probing and it does a try accept and it does all that stuff right. Um, but it'll take a pointer and it'll say, let's say it contains an embedded length field. And what they'll do is they'll dereference the user land pointer and they'll make sure that length field is valid. It's gotta be, let's say, I don't know, bigger than 10 and smaller than 100 or something. And then sure enough, that's true. And then right after that, they'll dereference that pointer again. They'll take the length field and they'll use it to do something else. And the difference is that there's a race condition here um, where uh, basically um, between the first check and the second check, um, you know, I, because I, I can have a second user land thread that basically overwrites that memory so that when you check it, it's okay, and then when you start using it, it's some totally different value. Um, and this is, so this is a simple example of, of what that could look like, <clears throat> where basically, you know, you'll have some, some, uh, some function in kernel um, where you pass it, you know, some, uh, some user pointer, um, and uh, <clears throat> user pointer will uh, contain some uh, embedded length field. So in this case, it's got to be you know smaller than 100, um, and then you know they use that um, length field to copy into a local stack buffer that's 100 bytes. Um, and so between that check in red the first time and the use in the in the on the copy memory, um, you can have a second use land thread that overwrites overwrites the length. Um, <clears throat> And uh, basically, you end up with uh, memory corruption. Um, and this is uh, an example of, of a bug that is a, a double and triple fetch that I found in the uh, F-Secure AV program a couple of months ago. Um, and I have a link to the advisory below um, if you want to look at it. Um, the fix for this kind of stuff is basically um, capture data, validate, and only then do you use. Never fetch again. Keep the, cap keep the data you captured and validate that and use that. <clears throat> Um, uh, similarly, for, for user land type stuff, is uh, basically um, uh, it's sort of uh, nullity references. I, I consider that in the same class. Uh, it's not specific to Windows uh, drivers. I actually spoke about this particular bug um, at the CC conference here uh, in 2006. Um, I was talking about uh, the Linux kernel at the time, uh, but it applies just as well to uh, the Windows kernel. Um, and basically, the only difference is in, in sort of the, in trying to trigger, uh, or mapping the, the null page uh, is in, 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 uh, in Linux and Unix, you basically do mmap and you say, you know, uh, you say fix and you just give it uh, an address of null and it'll go map it. Uh, in Windows, it's, it's slightly more tricky where basically, if you try a map, uh, the address null, it basically sort of goes like, oh, null means you don't mean an address, well, I'll just locate it for you. And so the way you're supposed to do it is you say, no, the address is one, and then what it does is it rounds down to one to a zero, and then it goes to maps the null page. Uh, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, this used to be a much bigger deal. Um, as of Windows 8, um, mappings of the null page are disallowed. 
um, which isn't, so that's what, that, that's what it'll tell you, and it isn't entirely accurate. Um, on 64-bit windows, mappings of the node page are disallowed. On 32-bit windows, mappings of the node page are disallowed by default, uh, but there's this thing called the uh, NTVDM, which is the virtual DOS machine. So if you want to run old DOS games, for example, um, you have to turn this stuff on, and all of a sudden, you can have no point references in your old DOS games, and those would then allow you to uh, exploit no point references um, in Windows drivers. Um, essentially, uh, but even if in this if we, if this sort of uh, uh, little corner case doesn't work, and and we we take the premise that no no map no mappings can't aren't allowed in Windows as of Windows 8, um, there are still some exceptions where no pointers in kernel might be exploitable. Uh, so one is if you have uh, no plus a large offset, where the offset basically becomes your pointer. Um, a, a common case of this might be where. Um, uh, you have a mem copy, rever uh, a reverse mem copy, or where you pass null to a function that has a special meaning. Uh, yeah, the fix is basically defensive programming, right? I mean, we all know about null pointed references. They're, they're, no, they're nothing special. Um, okay, let me, I'm just going to skip this because I'm running out of time. Okay, so memory related bugs. Uh, this is number four out of the five I had. Um, basically, if you're a, um, uh, a Windows driver, um, there's two set of APIs you do to allocate memory. Um, it's the allocate pool and allocate uh, pool with quota. Um, uh, and basically, um, there's a discrepancy between the two where one of the APIs, when it fails, returns null, and the other API, when it fails, uh, throws an exception. Um, so if you mix up one with the other, all of a sudden, you're checking for a turn value, but you might get an exception. Or you're, you have an exception handler, but what really happens is you get a no pointer back. Um, so uh, uh, you have to get those uh, straight. Um, and I believe one of the, the uh, pool with quota actually allows you, it has an option where you basically go to it and say, hey, instead of uh, throwing, give me a null. Uh, I would recommend using the API that way because then you have consistency. Uh, um, but that's one of the ways you can, these API, you can go wrong uh, using these APIs. Um, there are uh, um, uh, two other things. One is basically, so the um, allocate pool with quota is basically done so that anytime you do an allocation uh, uh, in kernel uh, based, uh, driven by user land, uh, you're supposed to do allocations based on the quota of the user land caller, right? So in my view, anytime you do an, uh, an alloc based upon driven by user land, you should always do the quota alloc. If you don't, I think that's a bug. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the other are, are simple case, right? Whereas, obviously, yes, you know, if you don't check return value, yes, you may have nullity references. Uh, if you don't handle exceptions, yes, you may have unhandled exceptions. Um, and even if you are, um, you can have uh, faulty exception logic. Um, these, you know, these are pretty simple, you know, f fixed wise. It's like, yes, check return values. Yes, um, charge quota when you have to. Yes, cap buffers, please. Don't have unbounded allocs. Um, so the second sort of memory-related issue, and this is, again, this is new as of Windows 8, and this is mostly a mitigation type thing. Um, so by default in Windows, when you used to do a, a memory allocation, um, the pages you would get back were executable. Um, as of Windows 8, um, that is no longer true. So there's a page pool and non-page pool. Um, for the uh, page pool, by default, uh, they are now not executable. Um, for the non-page pool, they still have to be. And so they came up with this new thing called a non-page pool, not executable. And the idea is that uh, anytime you do a, a non-page pool um, uh, alloc nowadays, uh, is that you specify this particular pool, the non-page pool NX, unless you really need executable non-page pool memory, um, which is not impossible, but it, it, it's pretty rare that you actually need it to also be executable. Um, and in that case, sure, go ahead and use the, the non-page pool one. Uh, but in any other case where you need non-page pool memory and you don't need it to be executable, you should really use this flag. Um, it's not a bug per se by itself. It's really sort of, uh, you know, the, the, this, this, uh, this non-executable non-page pool is really mitigation expectation. And so the idea is that if you use this incorrectly, you're kind of killing a mitigation. Um, and so, uh, um, basically, the, the idea is that, um, you know, um, let me go back. The, the idea basically is that, is that uh, um, you, you use this, the non base pool NX, um, um, if you're going to do, um, if, if you're going to um, do non base pool executable, uh, um, 
allocations. Um, so the next uh, memory-related uh, uh, bug sort of the, there's, there's this API called MM get system address for MDL, uh, which is basically, if you get an MDL, how do you get it mapped in your virtual address space or kernel? Um, this old API basically, um, uh, if you call it, there's the risk of, if it, if it can't map it, what it does is um, it causes a kernel panic. Um, and so there's a new API called MM get system address for MDL safe, uh, and that one doesn't uh, cause a, a kernel panic. Um, and so obviously you should use a new one. If you see the old one, that's a bug. And while this seems easy, there's still a fair amount of drivers that use the old API. And I started thinking about it, and I, I think, I mean, there's, there's two reasons why you would still have that. A, if you have an old code base. But I think B is if you're um, developing based upon uh, uh, driver books and document, uh, basically books that basically um, tell you to use the, the old API because the book was written before the new API existed. And there's actually, there's plenty, of, most of these kernel driver books are relatively old. Um, and so they, they advise using uh, that API. And I think that's why these bugs are still around. Um, yeah, so this is basically what I was talking about earlier, right, where when you have these MDLs that are used um, to create um, a double mapping between user and kernel, all of a sudden you end up with these double fetches again, right? Where um, let's say you have a, um, like an article that comes in with uh, method indirect, uh, and you 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 take it, you get your kernel point out of the MDL, and you just sort of using like embedded length fields, um, then. Uh, not realizing that that memory can be changed any given time by a user land thread. So you end up with all of these sort of double fetch bugs again. Um, the thing is, they're not quite as obvious as the ones that are directly from uh, um, the ones I showed earlier because you're dealing with a kernel pointer. So if you just look at the, po the pointer, you'd, you would assume that um, uh, user land doesn't really have direct uh, um, control over it. Um, and so that, that's why they're not as obvious. Um, this is a, a very simple sort of example of, of what that would look like, right? So you have an MDL, and you say, okay, it gets the matter for MDL safe, and then you get your data back, and then you say embedded length, and then you kind of go, okay, we'll use, uh, uh, um, we'll use that embedded length. Uh, uh, but because it comes from an MDL, you can have a second use land thread that just changes your embedded length after validation, but before use. Uh, did I? Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over this because I'm really close to running out of time. Uh, so I think I have two more minutes. Sweet. Um, let me get to the, uh, uh, the fifth part, uh, object handling, where basically, so uh, when user talks to kernel and it basically says, okay, here's a, some handle to some file, go do something with it. Um, the, the way the, dry, the kernel goes, says, okay, well, I'm supposed to, how do I, how do I get, how do I translate this handle to a kernel pointer I can use? Uh, you call this function called uh, reference object by handle, and that basically translates one to the other. Um, and the API looks like this, and it has this thing called object type and access mode. And basically, object type says um, enforce that it is that the object that the handle is of this particular type. And Windows has about forty something different types of, of objects. Um, and so you can, you, if you take a handle from user and kernel and use this API, and you say um, uh, object type is null, there's no type enforced, and you get all of these classic uh, type confusion bugs. Um, so that's one. Uh, two, the second bug you can have here is basically um, where if you, the access mode, you're supposed to specify user. If you specify kernel, then all of a sudden, uh, user land gets to give you handles that are really kernel handles. And so because handle numbers are really not secrets, they're easy to brute force, and all of a sudden, uh, if you say X mode is kernel mode, uh, user all of a sudden gets to tinker with your kernel handles. Uh, okay. Uh, another thing with uh, this kind of object stuff is that once you dereference and you're done, you're supposed to dereference it, and then you know, you're done with handle. And so quite often, you'll have these bugs where um, uh, basically, um, like let's say you have some kind of exception that gets thrown and you forget to leak a hand, you forget to deref a handle, um, and all of a sudden this handle leaks. So that this is a known sort of ref counting bug, except the problem with this is if this is repeatable, uh, most ref, like your, your, let's say your ref count is uh, 32 bits, if, this, if you can repeat this about four billion times, your ref count overflows to zero and all of a sudden you have a, a I've got 
Awesome, perfect. Um, uh, it, so if, this, if your ref count uh, in overflows, all of a sudden uh, it goes to zero, your object gets freed, but you may still have a reference to it, and all of a sudden you get these, these uh, um, use after free cases. Um, as of, I think, Windows 8, um, there has been code added to the uh, uh, ob reference call um, where basically they detect an intro flow. When, when an intro flow happens, um, they cause a kernel panic. Um, and so all of a sudden, these bugs are no longer exploitable beyond a leak, uh, which is great. Um, but up to Win 7, that was still a problem. Uh, related issues are um, a, a double ref count increase, uh, uh, use after ob reference, and a, a passing of null. And uh, the fix is basically always balance your reference calls. Uh, uh, and I'm done. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we do not have time for questions. <laughs>